Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's my privilege first to introduce you to proud Wurundjeri man, Colin Hunter, Jr. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honour and privilege to be here tonight. My name is Colin Hunter IV. I would like to start off with acknowledging that this evening we are on Wurundjeri country, home of my ancestors and also home to everybody here this evening. I wish to pay my respects to both elders past, present and emerging, elders from all nations, especially all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members here this evening. Wurundjeri is a part of the Kulin Nation and of the Warong language group. Wurundjeri country extends from the inner city of Melbourne across to the Great Dividing Range, west to the Werribee River, south to the Mordialic Creek and east to Mount Borbore. A big thank you to everybody who has helped make this event possible this evening. Woman Jekka, welcome and I hope everyone has a fantastic evening ahead. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you so much, Colin. You have our utmost respect and gratitude. Um, my name is Dr. Emma Shortus. I'm Senior Researcher in International and Security Affairs at the Australia Institute. And alongside my colleague, the Australia Institute's Chief Economist, Dr. Greg Jericho, it's my great pleasure to be your host for this evening. This year, the Australia Institute is celebrating our 30th anniversary as Australia's leading think tank. And as part of our anniversary celebrations, we're bringing some of the world's leading thinkers to Australia. And we are delighted to host visionary economist Yanis Varoufakis in Adelaide, Sydney, Canberra, and of course here in Melbourne for tonight's sold out event. For 30 years, the Australia Institute's independent, non-partisan research has played a critical role in shaping Australian public policy for the better. Some of our recent achievements include playing a central role in the federal government's decision to redesign the stage three tax cuts to deliver an additional $84 billion from high income earners to low and middle income earners over the next 10 years, which is the culmination of five years of Australia Institute research and advocacy. <laughs> also helped persuade the Senate to block the company tax cuts for big business proposed by the former coalition government. There's the announcements, announcement of no less than six different inquiries into prices and price gouging following our influential research exposing how excessive corporate profits were largely responsible for driving the lion's share of the burst of inflation that followed COVID lockdowns. And of course, Australia also now has a National Anti-Corruption Commission following a decade of research and advocacy from the Australia Institute, exposing the serious flaws and gaps in our integrity system. And while we're known for working across the political aisle to achieve change, we aren't shy about taking on powerful vested interests or tackling the structural causes of the problems we face. We live, after all, as Yanis Varoufakis has written, in a world of polycrisis, in desperate need of change. And to that end, it is our privilege to welcome Professor Varoufakis here tonight. He is, as I know you are all aware, a visionary economist, the former finance minister of Greece, a tireless political leader, and a best-selling author. His latest book, Techno-Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism?, is his boldest and most far reaching yet. And he will be signing copies out in the foyer after our event. So make sure you get your hands on one if you haven't already. Techno-feudalism argues that capitalism is dead, but not in the way that we might have hoped. Yanis will speak to us for a little while before joining Greg and I for a chat. So to explain to us our post-capitalist state of polycrisis, and how we might begin to imagine a way out. Please join me in welcoming Professor Yanis Varoufakis.
Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Greg. Thank you to the Australia Institute for bringing us here tonight. Uh, in an era when economics, a language designed to express in a language that no one comprehends things that everybody understands, for the purposes of disguising as economic policy, brutal attempts at looting the social and natural wealth of a country, of every country, the work that you do at the Australian Institute and similar NGOs is crucial. Because let's face it, our democratic system is no longer. Uh, our two-party system, whether we are in the Australia or in the United States or in the United Kingdom or in Germany or in Greece, wherever we are, it has been, been, been completely usurped and co-opted by vested interests that uh, are pushing humanity very, very quickly, quick marching humanity to climate catastrophe and to social decay, which in the end only benefits the I will call them simply neo-fascists because I have no time for concocting different ways of describing them. Whether it's Trump, Le Pen, Advanced Australia, Fair, or whatever. <laughs> okay, let's warm up the conversation. Three questions in lieu of an introduction. First, why is Australia being pushed by the United States into the intensification of a new Cold War against China, which is detrimental to the interests even of Australian capitalism? That's question number one. Question number two, why did Elon Musk spend 43 billion US dollars to buy Twitter? Question number three, why is uh, the German car industry the epitome of the German business model, the industrializing and in serious crisis, even though the German car industry is producing as many cars as it used to 10 years ago. Three very different questions. But I shall endeavor to convince you that they have the same answer. And it is the same answer for which I, the same reason for which, which I tell the story or <laughs> make the outrageous argument that capitalism is dead. And it all has to do with a historic mutation. The way I see it, this is an idea that crept up on me around seven, eight years ago. Capital triumphed to such an extent that it became unleashed from all shackles, from all constraints. Its triumph became so galloping, so fast, so unstoppable, that like a stupid virus, it mutated to a more toxic version, so toxic that like you know, Ebola, the reason why Ebola has not taken over the world, why we don't have a pandemic of Ebola, is because the Ebola virus is so toxic that it kills its host before it manages to propagate itself across the earth. Capital mutated into a new form of capital, which are called cloud capital, which has killed capitalism when we were looking elsewhere, when we were too busy discussing the pandemic, uh, wars, and various other real issues, which nevertheless prevented us from seeing that we have a major, a great, I would say, transformation, which is the equivalent of that which changed the world around the end of the 18th century, when feudalism was transformed into capitalism. My hypothesis in the book, which brought me out here, is that in the same way that we had a great transformation from, capitalism, from feudalism to capitalism, around the 1770s, 1780s, 1800s, we now have already a great transformation from capitalism to something that I call techno-feudalism. Now, if I'm right, and it is the mutation of capital that has given birth to this new mode of production, 
then maybe those three questions that I began with have an answer which is common, logical, and credible. Very quickly, what do I mean by cloud capital? Well, capital has been the same from time immemorial. Capital pre-existed capitalism in the sense that what is capital? It's not money. It's produced means of production. So a fishing rod is a capital good. You produce the fishing rod, not because you want to eat it or play with it, but because you want to catch fish. So it's a produced means of producing something else, a tractor. Very few people buy tractors to ride them around Melbourne, you know, and show off. They buy them to produce something else, wheat, some agricultural commodity. Uh, the steam engine. The steam engine was invested into, invented and purchased in order to help produce coal down the mines or textiles in the first factories of the industrial revolution. Electricity grids, all these are capital goods. They are produced means of production, except this. What lives in here is a kind of capital. It's physical capital. People used to talk, remember, about dematerializing. There's no dematerializing. If you go into a server farm, it hums like a factory. If you look at the optic fiber cables crisscrossing our oceans, they're you know, they really material things. Cell towers, these things, okay? It's real capital. It's material capital, except its purpose is not to produce anything. Its purpose is to modify our behavior. So my narration of what is going on is this. The moment you enter Amazon.com, you've exited capitalism. You've exited the market. Amazon.com looks like a market, but it isn't a market. In a market, you have the capacity to socialize. You go to the fish market. You talk to the fishmongers. You talk to one another. You and your friend walk down the fish market and you look at a particular fish and you see the same fish. The moment you enter Amazon.com, if you and I enter Amazon.com and type um, some kind of commodity, you know, electric oven or binoculars or basketballs or electric bicycles, you and I are going to get different recommendations. Why? Because cloud capital is a networked machinery the purpose of which is for us to train it, to train us, 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 to ad infinitum, to know us, to give us good advice, win over our mind and heart through good advice, and then input desires into our bosom, which then the same algorithm satisfies directly by selling it to us, bypassing every market. And in the process, collecting 40% of the price from the capitalist, the vassal capitalist, who also dwells in this digital fiefdom called Amazon.com. So if I am right, Jeff Bezos has nothing to do with Henry Ford. Mark Zuckerberg is not another version of Rupert Murdoch, of Westinghouse, of Edison. Because whatever you may think of Rupert Murdoch, and I don't think much, or Edison, or Westinghouse, at least they were monop brutish monopolists trying to make you buy their stuff. Bezos doesn't give a damn about what you buy. He doesn't make anything. He simply controls the digital fiefdom. He's a techno feudal lord on which all transactions take place through matching buyers and sellers by his algorithm that prevent you from talking to anyone, including the person you are buying from, and collecting the ground rent, which I call the cloud rent. If that is so, and given that, 40% of global income is now siphoned off by these techno feudal lords or cloud delists, as I call them in the book, then this is no longer Capitalism, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to techno feudalism. And I believe that the answer to the question 
The first question, why is there a new Cold War between the United States and China, where Australia is dragged into on a perilous path towards Australia's financial and economic ruin, not to mention the possibility of thermal nuclear warfare? The answer is because there are only two countries in the world that have cloud capital, America and China. And the United States establishment recognize correctly that Chinese cloud capital is in clear and present danger to its hegemony. If I'm right about this hypothesis, this also answers the question about why Elon Musk purchased Twitter. He had old-fashioned capital, excellent, brilliant old-fashioned capital, Tesla, SpaceX, Starlink. This is an all wonderful pieces of very modern, all, all singing, all dancing pieces of old-fashioned capital. What he didn't have was cloud capital. Twitter gave him that. And why is Germany falling behind the car industry? Because if you own a Tesla, Elon Musk can switch it off. You know that? He can actually press a button and you don't go anywhere from the cloud. And also, increasingly, Tesla is going to be making money, not so much from the sale of cars and spare parts, but from the fact that as you drive the Tesla, the cloud that now Elon Musk owns knows exactly what you said to your partner on the phone while you were driving the Tesla, what music you were listening to, where you went, when you visited your daughter, your son, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, huh? and what mood you were in, and all this data, he sells to Amazon.com and gets another part of the surplus that Jeff Bezos usurps from people that sell you things directly bypassing the marketplace. Volkswagen cannot do that. This is just a warm-up. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Thanks. Um, I am going to defer to our chief economist for the first question. Uh, thanks, Emma. Uh, these on? Yes, yeah. they're on. Good. Um, Yana, so I'm going to actually um, uh, push back on a few things, and I'm going to to quote uh, a very good source, your father. Uh, for those who, who haven't uh, read uh, Yanis's book, uh, it's actually essentially written to his father. Um, and very smartly, Yanis has uh, put in his own words what his father is saying to him, which certainly makes uh, debates with your dad a lot easier. Your dad uh, writes or says, I'm unconvinced. Feudal lords never invested in anything except intrigue and violence. Your cloudless, in contrast, invest massively in the highest use, highest of high-tech capital. They are the epitome of capitalists, pouring money into research and development in order for, to produce new and desirable commodities. Now, and you did mention that in your speech that they're different from Henry Ford, they're different from Westinghouse and, and Edison. Can you sort of tease that out? I mean, why aren't they just like all capitalists we've had forever who they essentially want to take over all competition and, and destroy it and, and reap the, the maximum profits. Thanks, Greg. A small preface. The book was initially going to be entitled Talking to My Father with a subtitle, A Brief Introduction to Technofeudalism. But Penguin, in their infinite wisdom, decided to overrule me and call it Technofeudalism because it would sell better. And uh, as you know, authors have absolutely no power over publishers, <laughs> okay? So I very much regret that it's not called talking to my father. Anyway, that's the end of the preface. Uh, that's what my dad would have said. And that's what quite a few people actually um, told me and protested regarding my hypothesis. Now, let me be absolutely clear on this. I'm not arguing that we've gone back from capitalism to feudalism. No, we've gone forward to something which has elements of feudalism based on a particular form of capital. So the difference is exactly as you put it, and as my dad would have put it, 
that yes, feudal lords under feudalism didn't have to invest a penny. They were born, uh, the lottery of birth landed them in the landed uh, gentry. Uh, and courtesy of the property rights that were bestowed upon them by the feudal regime, they could extract rent, ground rent, from the peasants and the vassal producers, like artisans, like smiths, and you know, instrument makers. Zuckerberg, Bezos, Bill Gates, the cloudalists, have invested indeed a huge amount of a small aside here, 90% of it was state money. It was money that was produced by the central banks of the G7, particularly the Fed, but not just the Fed, the European Central Bank, the, Europe, the, the Central Bank of Sweden, of Switzerland, of Japan, of China, a little bit of the Reserve Bank of Australia. Nine out of $10 that built up this cloud capital came from the state which you know, is, is interestingly intertwined with the history of feudalism in the sense that the state was the, you know, the institution that granted the, the lords and the earls and the barons the power to extract rent from the, from the peasants. Uh, setting that aside, the point I'm making is that we have a new form of fiefdom, which is based on all singing, all dancing, cloud capital, technology. So yes, Zuckerberg invested a lot of money to build the fiefdom. And in that fiefdom, right, there, is, there are transactions between actual capitalists, capitalists, old-fashioned capitalists who are actually producing stuff. He's a capitalist who doesn't produce stuff. He's a capitalist who has produced the fiefdom that allows him the opportunity that grants him the power to extract a rent, which is not ground rent this time, it's cloud rent, that's why I call it cloud rent, from the capitalists. And also to extract labor, free labor, from all of you, the cloud serfs, because every time you like anything, you post a video, you upload a review of a book or a product, you're adding to the cloud capital of the cloud list for free. That's your free labor. You may love doing it. There's no doubt about it. I am an addict. I keep doing things on the internet. Uh, but that doesn't stop, that doesn't change the fact that this is free labor, even if you're enjoying it. I mean, don't forget that the worst slavery is the one that we volunteer. So we, this is a leap forward. It's a very dystopic leap forward. Uh, it's not as we, when I say we, I mean you know, old leftists and reconstructed Marxists like myself. Imagine that we would go from capitalism to the first stage of humanity's history, uh, the stage where there would be no social classes structurally extracting value one from the other. Uh, but after all, Rosa Luxemburg put it very succinctly from her prison cell when she said, when she asked us a question, Socialism or barbarism? Now we have techno-feudalism, which is a form of barbarism. And you say in your book, and again, your, your dad sort of suggests, but aren't these just the same as old capitalists in the sense that like TikTok is, is competing with Facebook and Amazon and Walmart are competing just the same as General Motors and Ford competed? What's, and you, you point out to your dad, I'm sorry, despite the similarities, no, it's not the same. Yeah. How is it different and what's that, that crucial difference? There are several crucial differences. I'll start from the, the most poignant one. Ford produced a commodity. It was the Model T. He wanted everybody to have a Model T. He wanted to monopolize the, the, the market for cars and to spread his Model T everywhere. He bought politicians, municipalities, he ripped out the tramways in Chicago, in San Francisco, in New York, to replace them on the streets of the major American cities with his Model T. He was producing a commodity. Let me be clear on this. A search on Google search engine is not a commodity. 
a video on TikTok is not a commodity. The capacity to put things up on Instagram or upload stories in Facebook, these are not commodities. What they are is a means by which the cloudalist who lures you into these platforms in order to communicate with your friends, to find new friends, to impress people through your videos, through your influencing capacities and so on. Once you are in there, then you are being sold. Your attention is being sold. Desires have been created through this cloud capital so that you can purchase things and then the cloud list can extract cloud rent from this transaction. So the commodities continue to be produced in the capitalist sector. The capitalist sector remains essential to techno feudalism. In the same way that the primary sector, the agricultural sector remained central to capitalism. After the transition from feudalism to capitalism, it's not that land ceased to be important. I mean, how would the workers be fed if there was no agricultural production? What changed was that power shifted from the land to the machinery, from rent to profit, from landowners to capitalists. The point I'm making is very similar. Techno-feudalism still needs the land to produce uh, uh, stuff so that we can eat and nourish ourselves. Uh, and it still needs the capitalist sector to produce the surplus value that then the cloudalist scheme of. Can I um, ask you a little bit more about the cloudalists themselves, which is a much better descriptor than tech bros, I have to say. Um, you mentioned Elon Musk and his motivations in particular for buying Twitter, but I'm, I'm interested, I suppose, in the politics of the cloudalists. So, Musk's purchase of Twitter has revealed, I suppose, his neo-fascism and his particular climate politics. So his idea that you solve climate change by leaving Earth behind. Um, Zuckerberg is busy building his climate bunker in Hawaii. What, what do the politics of the cloudalists mean in this techno-feudal world? It's not just a, a system of economic control, is it? I will beg to differ to some extent because they are not all the same in terms of their politics. So compare and contrast Elon Musk with Bill Gates. Bill Gates compared to Elon Musk appears as a social democrat almost. He believes in taxing the rich. Yeah, He goes to Davos and gives these speeches about the importance of um, you know, empowering the global south. In the end, they're all the same. What they do is the same. They are creating a kind of capital which amasses cloud rent on the basis of um, essentially poisoning the conversation between all of us. Because this is how they make their money. The way that cloud capital operates in order to reproduce itself means it needs to keep you on your phone engaged and nothing engages you with a screen better than hatred, anger, fear, loathing, ugliness, in the same way that, it, as you know, let's face it, this is part of human nature. Let's be self-critical about that. If you're, you know, driving past an, an accident, it's very hard not to, not to look to look the other way. And as Rupert Murdoch once said, do you, you remember that amazing interview he gave in 1979 to a hapless BBC um, journalist who confronted him with what she considered to be a major um, challenge to his um, ethics and said, Mr. Murdoch, how is it that every time you purchase a newspaper, and she meant the Times of London back then, the quality goes down. And he said, well, nobody has ever lost money by underestimating the intelligence of the audience. Brutally honest. That's how, uh, imagine when you have this dialectical relationship between us 
And cloud capital, something we don't have with, with a newspaper, newspaper is one way. It says something, you read it. It influences you, bad enough. But this is in constant dialogue with you. You train it to train it to train you to train it. And therefore, the poisoning of the conversation. So it doesn't matter, even if, even if Elon Musk tomorrow had an epiphany and he became a feminist, tree-hugging greenie, it wouldn't make, make any difference. Yeah? And by the way, I don't think these people are neo-fascist. To be a neo-fascist, you need an ideology. These people don't have one. Um, the, 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 you know, the dream of going to Mars, this is just... Um, Essentially, it's, it's a way of acknowledging that they are destroying the planet. Does, with that, does, uh, I mean, we know the capitalists in the past certainly would, they co-opted governments, they essentially bought politicians and so forth. But then, back then, the, the ruse was, well, you'll build a factory in my state or electorate and, you know, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours and all that. What is the issue with politicians and governments and how they are interacting with these um cloudless or you know is there a, a quid pro quo at all or is it uh, they're captured and they don't realize it there is a little bit of that but it's pathetic it's a question of where do they put their you know their server farms so for instance in, in greece we you know the greek prime minister was waxing lyrical about microsoft bringing a server farm in Piraeus. Who gives a damn? I mean, you know, it, it, it depletes our electricity resources and employs 30 people after it's built, right? Uh, so, but, but you know, the, the thing is that no politician, no career politician, no politician who wants to make a career, career out of politics will ever dare stand up against the cloud elites unless they have... A, they are in Australia and they have Rupert Murdoch with them. And they all gang up together against Facebook you know, to extract a few pennies for Rupert Murdoch. Which they're pretty unhappy about. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that the, many of the cloudalists do have in common, um, and we, we will speak about China, but many of them are, are American. They're American. And um, you like. They're only American or only or Chinese. Chinese. Yeah. Um, and we will, uh, hopefully, we'll get to the question of the new Cold War, but I wanted to, to stick with the United States for the moment because you lay the, the rise of techno-feudalism um, really at the, at the feet of American empire using, using this metaphor of the Minotaur. Australia, as you mentioned, is, is uniquely close to the United States and uniquely exposed to empire. So what, what do you think is the, the future of American empire in a techno-feudal world? What can we expect from the United States? Well, I usually refuse to present myself as a prophet. My capacity to predict is minuscule. And I think everyone's capacity to predict is minuscule. So we you know, better come clean with that. Uh, the clear and present danger to the hegemony of the United States is the effect of cloud capital on the monopoly that the United States has on the payment in the international payment system. And that is why we have a new Cold War. So we're merging this question of yours with a question which I suppose will come regarding the new Cold War. And the reason I'm saying this is this. Ask yourselves, how is it that the United States became more hegemonic after 1968, 69, 1970, 1971, which was the time when it became essentially bankrupt. If you look at its trade deficit, it is gigantic. But interestingly, and this is, I think, the key paradox of our era, which is the reason why I wrote that book, which you kindly mentioned, The Global Minotaur. The more in the red the United States became, the more dominant it became. And that has never happened in the history of humanity before. Up until then, when an empire went, slipped into the red, went from being a surplus economy to being a deficit economy, it 
lost its power. It, the fall began. The rise and the fall of the Roman Empire, when did the fall come? When they started going into the red. The Byzantine Empire. The Spanish Empire. The British Empire. It was, you know, especially after the First World War, when the British Empire lost its capacity essentially to loot the trade surplus of India. And when that by 1930-32 was complete, Britain was finished. And it was then a long process of coming to terms with that. Uh, but the United States has a much greater trade deficit than any of the empires before. And yet the more, it, the greater its trade deficit, <laughs> the more powerful it is. And this is, this is, um, this is the key. I came to recognize what the answer to that question was. Uh, I don't remember exactly how, but there was a moment when I read an exchange between two significant American policymakers. Henry Kissinger, remember him? He died recently. Uh, and Paul Volcker, he, he also died re relatively recently. Now, Paul Volcker, for those of you who don't remember who he was, he was uh, a key chairman of the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States between 1987, 1988, sorry, 1978 and 1987. So between Carter and the end of the Reagan era, which some people will remember as the establishment of the neoliberal order of the Washington Consensus. Now, this guy, Paul Volcker, when he was much younger in 1970, he worked at the National Security Council for Henry Kissinger, who then was at the National Security Council. That was before he became the foreign minister of the United States, before he moved to the State Department. And Kissinger, because the only thing he cared about was geopolitical relative power, asked the pertinent question. He could see that America was slipping into a deficit, trade deficit. And he sent a memo around the people that worked for him at, at the National Security Council, one of them being Paul Volcker. And he said, how are we going to maintain our hegemony given that we are now in the red? Now, if that was in Germany, had he asked this question of German officials, they would immediately say austerity. If we're in the red, we tighten our belts so that we are no longer in the red. That's what the Australian treasury would say too. Uh, we, we need to have a surplus. Let's go straight into austerity. Let's cut down on, you know, health, education, whatever, not defense spending or offense spending. Um, what was Paul Volcker's answer? What we must do is must, uh, we must avoid austerity and belt tightening at all costs. We must treble our deficit and make the rest of the world pay for it. Now, Australia cannot do that. Greece cannot do that. The United States could do it. Why? Because they had the dollar. And the dollar is the only currency in the world which people demand, they want of, more of, even if they don't want to buy anything from the United States. With the Australian dollar, that is not the case. People demand the Australian dollar if they want to come here on holiday, yeah? if they want to buy something from Australia. But if you put petrol in your car, if you still have a petrol car that has been extracted from East Timor and has been refined in Australia and didn't involve a single American company, let's say, or from Nigeria that was refined and sold by Total, the French conglomerate, you still demand dollars because the denomination of oil is in dollars. So that was the advantage. Okay, now where, where am I getting at? To make you happy because you're a foreign expert, foreign policy expert. Sometime, some years ago, when Trump was elected, one of the first things he did was he tore up an agreement between the West, the United States and Europe and Iran to end the sanctions on Iran. It was, I remember in the one conversation I had with Obama, he said to me, that this was the one thing he wanted to do before leaving office. He had done it, Merkel had done it. It was all done, it was a done deal. And then 
Trump is elected and tears it up. And Angela Merkel was very peeved with that. And she got out for the, I think this was probably the only time when Angela Merkel made a statement that was slightly controversial. And essentially she said, Germany is not going to follow the United States and German companies are going to do, continue to do business in Iran and there will be no sanctions, no reimposement, no, no reimposing of sanctions, remember that. And what happened the next day? Every single German com company, CEO, conglomerate came out and said, uh -uh, we are not doing business with Iran because all the payments for their supplies, for their um, um, sales and so on, go through the Federal Reserve's dollar payment system. Why am I saying all this? Why is this significant? Well, consider a particular application which is available on every phone by a Chinese company called Tencent. And the application is called WeChat. Now, WeChat is a remarkable application. It does everything that all our applications do, like streaming videos, the equivalent of tweeting, sending messages, WhatsApp, um, Airbnb, Uber. It's got all these facilities in one app, WeChat. But that's not what really worries the United States in Washington. What worries them is that WeChat is also a financial application. If you have WeChat, you can pay anyone who has an account in one in the Chinese currency with no fees. And it doesn't matter which bank they use. We do, do you have this in Australia? You don't have it. Do we have it in Europe? We don't have it. Do the Americans have it? We don't have it. It's not because we're technologically backward. It's because Wall Street will, al will not allow it. Wall Street demands to have the monopoly over the dollar payment system. So they will not allow Silicon Valley to create an application that effectively gets them out of the way, gets Wall Street out of the way. So there is Apple Pay, but there is a hefty fee to use Apple Pay. And a large amount of that is retained by Wall Street. Now the Chinese, under the Chinese Communist Party's policy and leadership, they have merged, their, they have told their bankers and their cloudalists, okay, now you're going to work together or else. And they know very well what or else means. So WeChat works seamlessly between cloud capital and finance. So fintech, Chinese fintech is light years away ahead of um, the American fintech. And that is a clear and present danger to the capacity of the United States to do that which Paul Volcker had advised Kissinger that they should be doing and which they have been doing since then, which is to use other people's money in order to maintain their hegemony. Because let's face it, up until even today, 70% of the profits of non-American capitalists end up in Wall Street. So when an Australian company sells aluminum to some Californian company, gets paid in dollars, 70% of the profits on average goes back to Wall Street in the form of purchases of American debt. So effectively, we are financing the American government and its trade deficit, uh, budget deficit. We are financing their trade deficit. And of course, real estate. The real estate, the American rentiers become richer as a result of that. If increasingly, and especially after the war in Ukraine, capital flows migrate as they have been migrating to the Chinese digital payment system, even from Europe, that is more dangerous for American hegemony than nuclear weapons. And that is my explanation of why we have the intensification of the Cold War between America and China. Yeah. I mean, one of, uh, one of the aspects of this and, and the, the use of the dollar or, um, in a sense, the use of, of uh, a currency, and you, we were talking before, and you were saying how um, 
we in a sense uh, are almost having to beg to be able to use these products and and there is this belief that uber and others are just giving us all this choice but you're you actually really push back on that and say it's actually not choice at all and that in a sense we have been captive or captured by these these firms and what we actually need is is the ability to own our own identification could you could you speak to that some in the book i give a particular example let's say you want to catch a taxi you want to hail a taxi to go to the airport uh, on the internet the way it has been constructed and privatized at some point sometime in the late 1990s you do not own a capacity to prove who you are you do not own your digital identity now when you do own your analog identity you have your driver's license you have your passport yeah? and you can the state has provided you with a document that allows you to identify yourself on the internet it has not so think about it how do you identify yourself on the internet if you want to hail a taxi you need to download one of these apps uber let's say or lyft or some other app okay now, how does the app know that you are who you say you are? You have to put in your credit card details. So essentially, you are begging your banker, your financier, to vouch for who you are. You do not own your digital identity. This means that you are locked into Uber with your credit card. So there is this alliance between your banker and Uber. And once you are in Uber, then you hail a cab driver who gets ruthlessly exploited by the app and your data becomes um, fodder for the cloud capitalist behind Uber who then sells it to Bezos so that Bezos can extract cloud rents from the people that sell you stuff on amazon.com or similar devices. Now imagine Compare and contrast this. You see, the important thing is not to turn against the digital technologies. We should never turn against technologies. The problem is not the technology. Like, you know, I start the book with my father introducing me when I was six to an ancient Greek poet, Hesiod, who was lamenting the age of iron and how it would make humanity suffer forever. So the problem is not the technology, whether it's iron or the steam engine or the algorithm. The problem is who owns it and what you own. So imagine now that you had a way of proving who you are without using some conglomerate in order to, you know, to allow you to identify yourself. And you were to say, you know, that there was an application that is publicly created by the municipality of Melbourne, by you know the federal government, doesn't matter, the state government, and you go into that. Let's say it's called a transport, public transport app. And you, you say, uh, this is who I am and I want to go to the airport. Who wants to take me there? And then various cooperatives or drivers or you know, single person outfits can say, I'll take you. Or even the public transport system in Melbourne can send you a message saying, don't be stupid, catch a taxi, or catch a bus. It's you know around the corner. It will take you much faster or catch the train. Yeah? But you can't do that now. So it's not the pro the problem is not the technology. The problem is who owns it, who has property rights, rights over the, the cloud capital, which allow them to turn all of us into cloud serfs and the drivers and the workers into what I call cloud proles. Um I, I suppose just on that, I, I wanted to ask you what happens to democracy and democratic solidarity in a techno-feudal techno world? You know, we, we already live in a world where you said democracy is, um, well, it's in big trouble. And in the United States in particular, you know, systems aren't responding to democratic will. And, and I'm thinking in particular of Gaza and the fact that 80% of Americans want a ceasefire and are exercising their right to protest and sending a message to President Biden 
do you think there is room for that kind of democratic collective protest to still make a difference to our politics in a techno-feudal world? Democracy has always been a figment of our imagination. We never had democracy. Uh, but of course, we can even have we, we, we can have even less democracy uh, as the conversation get, gets poisoned. But Emma, thank you for bringing up Gaza because while there is a genocide happening, it is impossible for us to pretend otherwise and to talk in airy fairy terms about you know modes of production and new forms of capital and so on. So let me very, let let me make a very brief statement. As long as one Jewish person feels threatened because they are Jewish, I will wear the Star of David here in solidarity to the Jew who feels threatened courtesy of being a Jew. And as long as the apartheid of Israel continues its ethnic cleansing policies, which by the way, we must not blame on Jewish people, not even on Israel. We are responsible for that. And when I say we, I mean Australians, I mean Greeks, I mean Germans, I mean British, Europeans. Because we started as we always do, and we should do, with acknowledgement to the First Nations. We must never forget that what's happening in Gaza today is a direct extension of the logic of Terra Nullius. When the British arrived in this country and they declared this to be a land without a people, that's what Terra Nullius means, an empty land. This was the justification for genocide, the genocide of the First Nation people. This is exactly what's happening in the land of Israel. The, I started by saying that democracy is a figment of our imagination. Look, I think that as a Greek, I have the, and an Athenian for that matter, I have the right to make a point here. There is a profound difference between the Athenian democratic experiment, which lasted a few decades and then was crushed like a fragile flower, and what we consider in the West to be democracy. Our democracy in the West does not begin in ancient Athens. It begins with the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta was a sordid contract between the royal family, the king and the lords, which allowed the lords to have slaves and to exploit the slaves without the loot or all of the loot going to the king. It was a way of legitimizing the power of the aristocracy and of the royal family uh, based on the enslavement of the majority. If you look at the first constitution of modern democracies, the United States Constitution, which is a great document, but you look behind, you read in between the lines and you read the Federalist Papers on which it was founded, or written by the same people who actually wrote the Constitution, it's very clear. The whole point was how to keep the demos out of the democracy, how to make sure that the hoi polloi, the riffraff, did not control government, how to make sure that there would, uh, there would be an oligarchy with periodic elections that would ensure that the public did not control the government. So that was always the case. So I, you know, I, when I hear that our democracy is not what it used to be, well, it was never what we imagined it was. It was always a figment of our imagination. Now, of course, as I said briefly, cloud capital can poison even the possibility of a democratic movement because there have been times when, you know, it's a bit like the system of justice. The system of justice, especially in the United States, and so on, reproduces injustice. What it gives you is a chance, a possibility, an iota of a smidgen of a probability that justice will be afforded. Well, what cloud capital does is it extinguishes even that iota of a smidgen of a probability of democracy if our conversation is poisoned. Now, we have no alternative but to use these bits of cloud capital to communicate with one another. But that's why, I, and I meant that, you know, they don't pay me to advertise the Australian Institute. Um, I think that these think tanks and events like tonight's 
are essential for keeping alive the possibility of democracy. Thank you very much for that. And I guess now that all hope has been snuffed out, or it feels like it, and I know <laughs> the the, and I know you very much uh, in favour of hope, uh, but. In the, if we go back to 100 years ago and we're talking standard oil and, and various things, the solution to the massive capitalists was to break them up or we can tax them. Now, is breaking up the cloudless actually even worth it? I mean, you know, breaking up Facebook and Instagram, is that actually going to do anything? And if not, how do we tax these companies who are so, who, who essentially don't exist anywhere? And don't pay any tax at all. How how do we get over that hump and actually produce some cost so that they are not able to just uh, take all our our in a sense our work for free that we're providing to them happily, and also stop them um, you know absolutely uh, destroying our democracy for for no cost to them. Now, what are some of the solutions we can do, I guess? First, we have to rec recognize that the trust-busting past, glorious past of the uh, Theodore Roosevelt administration with Standard Oil and so on, will simply not do. Because, you know, what's the point of, how can you break up Google, the Google search engine? And, I mean, what is the point of breaking uh, And making it only, you know, functional. You cannot constrain it, confine it within California, right? <laughs> um, it, will be point, it will be pointless. Taking WhatsApp away from Facebook would simply mean that WhatsApp shuts down because WhatsApp is an interface that Meta uses in order to bring people into its broader empire. Uh, taxation. They will always have the better accountants and ensure that their capital expenditure will equal their revenues and therefore they will pay no tax on profits because they will never have profits because you know profit is uh, in the eye of the beholder uh, that isn't that doesn't mean we, there, there, there are not things we can do one thing we can do is the first thing we can do is uh, uh, introduce uh, a digital sales tax a cloud tax, I would call it. So every transaction that we perform on the inter on, on some app, whether this is buying something from Amazon or uh, pushing our advertisement for this event on YouTube, should have a five percent tax on at the point of sale, and that is the minimum we can do. And forty countries have that already. Indonesia has it. Australia doesn't have it. Uh, you should have it. That's one tiny little move towards clawing back some of the cloud rents that the cloud lists amass. Uh, the second thing we need to do, and that is much harder, is to understand that traditional taxation is not going to work. Uh, capital gains is not going to work with them because they never have any capital gains, really. But we have to understand that we provide their capital. We manufacture their capital. You see, that wasn't the case with uh, Henry Ford and General Motors and General Electric and BHP. When BHP bought a, a piece of machinery, they bought it from a producer of that piece of machinery who produced it using wage labor. But with Google, with TikTok, with Facebook, with Amazon, with Apple, the Apple Store, every time you do something on your phone, you're adding to their capital stock. So even if you don't do anything, just carrying your phone around enhances the cloud capital of Google Maps because Google Maps knows where you are. And if it knows where we all are, it knows where there's congestion. And that makes Google Maps very useful to everyone. So it, allow, it enhances the cloud capital of Google Maps just to have our phones. So we are producing for free their capital, but we don't get any, any dividends, either individually or collectively. So imagine if we were to agree at the level of the OECD, let's say, or even nationally, 
or in the European Union as a whole, that would be a turnout for the books. If to say to them, you want to operate in the European Union, okay, you will deposit 10% of your shares in a social equity fund, in a sovereign wealth fund. And the dividends accumulate there, and then we use the div dividends any way we want. My recommendation would be, since we all contribute to this capital, that it should be a basic income that stems out of that social equity fund where dividends accumulate. Uh, but in the limit, and because I am an, an constructed Marxist, okay, so that uh, full disclosure here, I think we should we should have full property rights over these algorithms. They should be collectively owned. I am afraid that's all we have time for. Sorry to be the bad guy. Please join me in thanking Yanis Varoufakis so much. If, if you could all remain in your seats for just a moment, Yanis and Greg are going to sneak up to the signing table because if you would like some more Yanis in your life, you can gr grab a copy of Techno Feudalism and get it signed in the foyer shortly. So while Yanis and Greg make their way up there, I'm going to keep talking. Yep. <laughs> um, I did want to let you know that both... Um, Yanis and I will be speaking. Thank you. Yanis <laughs> um, and I will be speaking at a conference here in Melbourne, actually on Saturday, in support of Julian Assange. Um, so I hope that you might be able to make it. Um, it's a, it's just a stellar lineup and a, an amazing program, and you can get all the info on that at nightfalls.info. Um, Yanis is also speaking at the National Press Club next Wednesday. If you are lucky enough to be in Canberra, there are something like five tickets left, so be quick. Um, you can also catch it on the ABC TV live stream if you like. And the Australia Institute will also be back here in Melbourne next week on Wednesday the 13th of March, hosting His Excellency Anote Tong, the former president of Kiribati, alongside independent MP Monique Ryan, the Australia Institute's Polly Hemming, and journalist Rachel Withers. Um, and they'll be talking about Australia's appalling climate hypocrisy in the Pacific. The information about that event is on the flyers that were on your seats and also on our website. Um, the Australia Institute is not funded by political parties or corporate partnerships. We are powered by donations from philanthropy, as well as small individual contributions from thousands of supporters across the country who value research that matters. You too can become a monthly donor to the Australia Institute and help us change minds at australiainstitute.org.au. Thank you again so much for joining us here and online. Please join me again in thanking my colleague, Dr. Greg Jericho and the incomparable Yanis Varoufakis.